Uh, my name is John Sennett. I'm going to talk a little bit about head and neck infections. This is the lymphatic drainage of the head. And it's important when targeting suspected areas of involvement to, to do a good physical exam and not only look, but also palpate. We often palpate under the angle of the jaw, but you know often the posterior chain is involved, say, with rubella. So make sure to examine the patient closely. Uh, Preauricular node here, often seen with sarcoid uh, and adenovirus. So, you know, a careful examination of the head and neck pays off. This is our first patient, a 17-year-old daughter of a physician. She comes in, sore throat, malaise, adenopathy, and she has here a bunch of palatal petechiae. Patrick, what, what do you think of when you see this? Uh, group A strep. Uh, group A strep is a thought. Group A strep is known to complicate this disease, and whenever you have that disease and they get worse, especially with spiking fever, you have to think of group A strep super infection. So now what do you think? Sure, Epstein-Barr virus infection. What are some other parts of Epstein-Barr? Ray? Other components of Epstein-Barr infection? Sure, you get adenopathy. It's the most common cause, infectious cause of splenic rupture. Okay, anyone with mono that suddenly gets worse is assumed to have group A strep and super infecting the tonsils. These are the typical type 3 downy cells. And if you look at these, the red cells are indenting them. And in the old days, I used to learn that when you had malignant cells, they indented the red cells. So this is not a... a neoplastic finding, this is simply a peripheral smear finding, suggestive of mono. So you may get a lab report back that says type 3 downy cells. The, additionally, with these patients, your diagnostic chest, test of choice would be what? Lily? Okay, for strep, a rapid strep screen is great. How about for EBV? a monospot, it's accurate and sensitive. I want you to move to the molecular age. You could do a PCR, and you can also do what else? IgM. So an EBV IgM, but you're pretty much going to know what this is anyway. If you look at the literature, the literature will tell you that steroids don't make any difference, and that antivirals don't make any difference. What is distressing is that many physicians will self-report that they've had great result with an antiviral and steroids. Uh, maybe that's a select group of patients. It's hard to tell, and they may just be getting better on their own. But the evidence tells you that no treatment is indicated but rather watch them for the development of group A strep. This patient comes in with burning of the lateral border of the tongue, Pamela. Okay? Has some vesicles on the ipsilateral tonsil and some drainage from the ear with some vesicles. Sure. Say it loud. This is Ramsey Hunt syndrome. So what do you want to do with this patient? Most data would suggest that antivirals and steroids are helpful. A special nerve is involved. Uh, I find it best not to go down with the ship alone, to call ENT for follow-up. Occasionally there are patients that develop unilateral deafness. It's uh, 
best to have an ENT person involved from the beginning. Okay? These patients will often have accompanying adenopathy, and people mistake it for a simple otitis externa, but it's not. That burning of the lateral border of the tongue and the interior vesicles are the giveaway. This patient comes in with pus-covered tonsils. They have fever of 102. Fung, what do you want to do with this patient? Pulse of 120, a rapid strep screen. Positive. Treat him. What do you want to treat him with? Penicillin. Penicillin for how long? Ten days. How about five days? No. It must be ten. Okay? Nonetheless, they're seen by someone who believes in shorter course therapy, and they get five days of antibiotics. They become afebrile on day three, feel better on day five, doing fine. Seven days later, they develop a second sore throat. And it doesn't project that well. Get the lights for a second. But notice how this tonsil pillar, fossil pillar, is into the midline. Ray, what would that suggest to you? The fact that this Fossil pillar is displaced medially. They have a, a fever. Go on. An abscess. What kind of abscess? A peritonsillar abscess. Okay. Very good. Now, the way you would drain that if you were inclined is with some suction in the ER and an X incision right here. And you might say, oh, leave that for the ENT. But many of the places we practice, Southeast Asia, India, you'd have a long wait for an ENT. Um, once it's drained, they do better. Antibiotics are not especially necessary. Okay? Usually you'd give group A strep coverage. Um, if you don't IND them, it dissects uh, around the venous arterial sheath, and you can develop vascular complications. We have a radiographic study there. Now our next patient is pretty simple. It's in May. The public swimming pools have just opened. Kids are swimming. This 12-year-old comes in with the worst sore throat of his life temperature 101, and they've got these shallow ulcers on the posterior fossil pillars. What might this be? I know, Nancy, you're thinking of herpangina, right? Coxsackie. Okay? And recall, angina is not pain. It's a smothering sensation. So it's herpes-like with smothering. The management of this Coxsackie virus is a thorough exam to make sure they don't have carditis. They can also have accompanying costochondritis, which is called the devil's grip or pleurodynia. And they'll be tender right over a costal cartilage. You can actually culture the virus uh, in newborn suckling mice from that cartilage. The virus replicates a couple places. Make sure they don't have a complication that could lead to an arrhythmia. The management of this is dilute hydrogen peroxide. Gargle with it. And it takes about a week to get better. But it is a very, it's thought to be the most painful sore throat and that so, such large issues are denuded. This can also mimic a GI disease. Which GI disease would it mimic? 
Crohn's disease. Very good. You can actually have tonsillar involvement with Crohn's. Why swimming pools? Uh, it's spread fecal orally. Uh, in Florida, the swimming pools, because they're so warm, bleed off Clorox, the uh, chlorine, and the virus is not killed effectively. But swimming pools are found to be a vector in most areas. Now here, we have a man from out in the west who was skinning a rabbit. Came in, they saw a family practitioner in Texas on their way to Florida. And the family practitioner gave them sodium sulamid eye drops. They now have I think you would call this pink eye to say the least and an anterior node. <laughs> that could be. What might this be? Pamela? Sure, this is ocular tularemia. Recall you can see tularemia as GI, ocular, septic, etc. It's important when you go to culture tularemia because of its spread in the laboratory. For gosh sakes, tell the lab what you're culturing. Don't let them open the plate up and be shocked. <laughs> oh, what's this? What a surprise from Pamela. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> So this is tularemia. Who wants to treat it with what? Nancy? OK, you could use doxycycline. Patrick, what do you want to use? Most patients use it. Most people use an aminoglycoside. Yeah, streptomycin can be used. Gentamicin is used. This is one of our radiographic studies here. You see prominent involvement of the retroorbital fat pad and proliferation. And this is actually a bacterial mass growing almost as jello back there. This shows the difference between a retroorbital abscess here and what it would look like with tularemia. Does everybody see the difference? A very dramatic. Uh, it's said that tularemia moves about as fast as group A strep. So the eye is sore Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday you're deteriorating rapidly. This patient comes in with this rash, pink eye, a cough, and sore throat. So the hallmark of this is cough, sore throat, pink eye, and they're in a boarding school in St. Pete. Two other children have the illness. Ray? I know Ray's thinking of adenovirus, right? Adenovirus associated pneumonia, adenovirus rash. It's known as pharyngoconjunctival fever, camp fever, C A M P, because it's common in military camps. Adenovirus, highly contagious, short lived immunity. You can get it again, but outbreaks in military barracks are well described in boarding schools. There is no treatment, send them home rest, and they should be away from other people. This patient comes in, and I apologize for the poor quality of the film, but this is the adenovirus sore throat. It looks just like group A strep. There's a lot of pus in the tonsil, discomfort, adenopathy, of course. It's an adenovirus. This is the sort of evanescent pneumonia. It doesn't have the best nodular quality, 
But if you look, you can sort of get an idea of some nodules in there. They'll be better in a day or two, and you want to treat them with cough suppressant. And recall, for a cough suppressant to work, it has to have an opiate in it. If you just give Robitussin, they'll get stoned, but they won't quit coughing. Got that? Always an opiate for cough. Do you believe me, Ray? Great. How enthusiastic. Thank you. Okay. Now, Ray, who should I call on with this patient? Who should I call on with this patient? Not you. Pick somebody else. Pick anybody. <laughs> okay. He has a full neck, a bull neck, and originally thought by Dr. Ayler, who glanced at him, to have diphtheria with a bull neck. But closer examination from the side, he has very poor dentition and the submental area is elevated up. Very good. This is Ludwig's angina. You must not miss it. Pamela, what is this? And who described this? Very good. <laughs> Pamela, go to the head of the class. <laughs> so Ludwig described it, and he described that the back three lower molars get abscessed, and it ruptures below the mylohyoid membrane, and it pushes the airway back and up, and it dissects into the mediastinum. Everybody got that? When it dissects into the mediastinum, the patient becomes septic, and they develop a three-component friction rub. Right? Now, what is that? Well, you're going to hear lubbed up of a heart. Okay? And then you hear a third sound, which is their respiratory rate making a, a fine grinding noise against the pericardium. Okay? So when they exhale, the pericardium folds around the heart and you hear a little bit of a scratchy noise. That's a three-component friction rub. Okay? This is a side view of his neck. And uh, what antibiotics should be on, and what's the management here? Nancy? Sure. Ampicillin, so back to him. Great choice. Anything else? Do you want surgery or hyperbaric intubation? Very good. Protect the airway. Then they need surgical intervention to drain it. A lot of them are able to be drained supraclavicularly above the airway. Occasionally, you actually have to go into the chest, but that's to be avoided if you can. And what bacteria is this? It's usually fusobacterium. The virulence factor for Fusobacterium, of all things, uh, it turns out to be a procoagulant. So it causes blood clots, which then frees up iron for the bacteria to use as an electron receptor and grow more readily. This is from the, that uh, abscess, and it's just what you'd expect from a tooth abscess. Gram-positive cocci, gram-positive rods, gram-negative, and anaerobes. This is a normal tympanic membrane. This is the tympanic membrane of a 22-year-old. What's unusual about that? The age, you're right. 22-year-olds don't get otitis media because they have big eustachian tubes. It's sort of uncommon. So you want to see what's going on there, okay? Um, this is one of the few areas with recurrent disease you actually might think about a, an immune deficiency workup. Um, but nonetheless, this is early on. What's some, what are some likely pathogens here? 
Mycoplasma causes a bullous meningitis, which is a clear water blister over the TM. This is a pus-causing bacteria. It could be pneumococcus. It could be H. flu, but pneumococcus would be your most common cause. And if you'd like to see some interesting reading, it's worthwhile reading on whether pneumococcal vaccine prevents ear infections. And I'll leave you all to sort out the data on that, but that's a worthwhile read. Okay? This patient comes in with a chronically draining ear and a persistent cough. The ear is cultured variously, staph aureus, treated got better, uh, pneumococcus treated got better, staph epi treated got better. Um, what might be on your differential? Could be an immunodeficiency, but it's one ear over four months and they have an associated cough. non-infectious, great. The causes of a chronically draining ear could be everything from histiocytosis X, eosinophilic granuloma, foreign body, syphilis would be an infectious cause. Um, the astute clinician in this case examined the patient and found the right upper lobe dull to percussion with decreased breath sound. Ray, this is the chest film. <clears throat> okay, dull to percussion, decreased breath sounds, cough, chronic draining ear. The patient has tuberculosis, and they have tuberculous otitis with a chronic draining ear. Okay? So always remember, no matter what the patient has, you have to do a full exam. And that would never have been tipped off if the person hadn't found a dull area to percussion. This patient comes in with a nodular warm red area after two episodes of otitis media, neither of which were treated because, quote, we wanted to see what would happen. Oh, very good. Mastoiditis. And what, that, what might that pathogen be? Actually, with these long strands, you'd also think of the actinomyces. This patient has the same syndrome of a draining ear. X-ray findings here, okay, of new bone formation. And this fullness here going from the tip of the mastoid. So it's an abscess arriving from mastoiditis. Fung, what is that abscess called? You get a trip to Europe if you get this right. No. <laughs> well, first, you have no friends, and second, they'll be wrong. <laughs> oh, no, I'm kidding you, of course. Okay, you remember Dr. Dr. Bezold, B-E-Z-O-L-D, described an abscess behind the sternocleidomastoid as a result of chronic mastoiditis. So what did tell me back what that's called? Bezold. B-E-Z-O-L-D. Name for Dr. Bezold. It's a Bezold's abscess. This patient, obviously in a developing country, has an oral lesion following herpes. What is it called? What bacteria is most commonly isolated? Lily, you're up. 
This is NOMA, or orofacial gangrene. It's a complication of primary herpes infection, and it's caused by Fusobacterium again. Okay? So this is NOMA, orofacial gangrene. It's a sequelae of primary herpes infection, and it's caused by Fusobacterium. This would be the primary herpes infection that would start it. Okay? Starts benignly and evolves to a severe necrotizing illness. The child is usually has quashiorcor or marasmus, protein calorie malnutrition. This is a delivery here specimen. This is an umbilical cord. Again, we have a trip this time to China. Who wants to take a chance on visiting Lanzhou, China? Pamela, you've always been interested in the Orient. This is your chance. Richard's agreed to upgrade it with Miles to business class if you get the award. <laughs> you don't want to go first class. Okay, just take the bus. <laughs> So, this is necrotizing funicitis. It's a cause of fetal death, and it's syphilitic involvement of the umbilical cord. So, when you hear of a child dying in utero of syphilis, they're dying of funicitis. These can be written off as stillbirth if the placenta and the umbilical cord are not delivered to, to the pathologist. And they will section. They will section the umbilical cord, and they will find this. So, Lily, what is this called again? Funicitis. Necrotizing funicitis. You can also have a funicitis that's just purely inflammatory, etc. This patient came in. They have a temp of 102. They have, and it's not, we need to check on this, but this is a very red area with sharp borders and a peau de rage appearance. You get a ticket to Subway <laughs> if, we, if you get this one right. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> the Subway on Dale Mabry. <laughs> so what might this be? This is erysipelas, um, a sharp border, poderage, always group A strep, okay? And what antibiotics do you get for group A strep? And they're diabetic. What should you do with them? Put them in the hospital. They're not going, even after you kill the bacteria with one dose of penicillin, you're going to have a tremendous amount of skin necrosis. Okay? This patient has a third nerve palsy uh, after sinusitis. Just seeing what it looks like. It was acute sinusitis. This is another diabetic patient who came in for a biopsy of a uh, sun-induced precancerous lesion. His um, glucoses were running about 300 that had type 1 diabetes for 40 years. He calls back in three days later with a temp of 103, severe burning pain in the ear, and is prepped for the emergency, uh, for the emergent, an emergent operation. Now the slides are reversed, but that's what's going on. May I have a diagnosis, please? It could be necrotizing fasciitis. This is malignant otitis externa. It's a pseudomonas infection of cartilage in the ear. 
although it's usually associated with diabetics picking at their ear, any damage to the skin or in the auditory canal can result in malignant otitis externa. They need to be debrided and receive potent anti-pseudomonas uh, coverage. Facial nerve paralysis, trapezius weakness, glossopharyngeal weakness. Okay? That entire neurovascular bundle is involved. Thank you very much. I, I hope you found that review of head and neck infections useful.